back with a new video for you and this is another Rudolf Steiner video and it's on Ariman and how Ariman is influencing our world and the coming times resulting from that influence. Who is Ariman? What is Ariman? And what did Rudolf Steiner have to say about these times that are coming up for us? Um, a lot of his predictions have come true. For example, his prediction on the bees that he stated um, almost a little over a hundred years ago now maybe a hundred years ago and he said if humanity doesn't change their ways then the bees would start dying out within 80 to 100 years of his prediction and here we are so we're gonna dive in with Ariman and see what's coming up and see what he's saying what we may be walking into and um, see how it all pans out <laughs> Hey guys, so this video is like I said on Ariman and we'll just start right off and on Wikipedia it says here Ariman is also known as Angramenu or Ang Angramenu or however you pronounce that and it's in the Avistan language. Um, that's That was the name of the destructive spirit or mentality, right? The main adversary in Zoroastrianism of Ahura Mazda. And Ahura Mazda represented the highest deity of Zoroastrianism. So I'll leave you to research that because um, I'm going to have to try and stay on topic with this topic because we can spiral off into never-ending um, rabbit holes. And so Arman, already from the, from the go, he is destructive, chaotic, disorderly, inhibitive, malignant, um, angry right so these are all it's it represents the evil spirit or the evil mind or the evil thought and which is in direct contrast to Ahura Mazda now Rudolf Steiner wrote several lectures and books on the influences of Lucifer and Ariman in on humanity so it's really interesting because I found that a lot of what he's written um, you can see it unfolding in our times. You can see it happening in our times. And we'll start off with this um, article here that I found. And I liked it because they put up this um, chart, right? And um, there are some interesting quotes which, I'll, which help to explain and help to see. So usually in Christian theology, we've got the forces of Christ against the forces of the devil who represents everything you know, all evil in one figure. And we've got Christ and God that represent something positive, right? And so Steiner does something different. He divides the devil into two beings, Lucifer and Ariman, and shows us how neither is bad per se, but both of them provide gifts to human beings that further our evolution. And I don't want to dive, like I said before, too much off topic, but this ties also in into the Archons. And the archons and for example also shamanic lore about entities mind parasites that have invaded humanity right so if you don't know anything about archons i'll list a couple links in the description box below or in the comment section and if you do um you know research that it'll it'll give you a little bit more information to work with right as well as researching um uh, carlos castaneda and the predators and things of that nature. So Steiner talks about Lucifer and Ariman and they're both um, aspects of, of evil, right? And very, very different polar opposites. <laughs> um, Lucifer on the one hand is frenzied energy, hyperactive, is all about gnosis, speaking and thinking and fantasy and illusion, superstition and flexibility and airy and the high flight of Icarus right? And um, Ariman, on the other hand, is like Saturn to the nth degree. This one is all about tediousness, boredom, um, statistics, proof, is very, is scientism, into scientism, is very reductionist, quantitative, into mathematical astronomy. Um, the technological advances are a hallmark of Aramonic energy. Now, understand how this works a little, right? So on the one hand, 
we have the personhood, but on the other hand, we have the energy of or the consciousness of. For example, if you walk into a room and you already know the people in the room, you've met them before, let's say it's a family gathering, and you would have your eyes closed just based on the energy that you feel or the atmosphere or the mood that you feel around a certain person or um, the sound of them, you know, you'll know who you're talking to, right? And so there are certain traits that people put in the room. And this goes for people, but this also goes for entities. This goes for a, a consciousness, right? And so when we have the Holy Spirit with us, um, the energy then is uplifted, enlightening, warm, alive, um, inspirational, right? But when we have the energy of Aramon, right, it's, it's not like that. It's very cold. It's dark. It's dense. This is one of the main things that people say, or Rudolf Steiner also says about the Aramonic energy. It's very dense. It's heavy. It's tedious. It's um, very mechanical, very, very mechanical. Lucifer, on the other hand, is high and mighty and flighty. And so Steiner also said that there were there are three incarnations. So Lucifer incarnated first 3000 years before Christ, then Christ incarnated, and now Aramon is to incarnate. And there's not much we can do about that. What we can do is figure out now how we're going to respond to that, right? How are we going to respond to this incarnation? And so that's what we, we we're doing is preparing ourselves for that because that one is probably going to be one of the most difficult ones to go through. See, when Lucifer fell to the earth, he brought information, right? So it wasn't, you know, on the one hand, um, Lucifer is evil, no doubt about it. <laughs> and um, we're not saying he's not, but he did um, open our awareness, right? Open our awareness and and open us up to being able to receive and understand and comprehend the message of the Christ, right? And when Christ then came and showed us the power of love and the power of surrender and the power of that he's redeeming us all, you know, um, that woke us up and brought us to the next level. But what Steiner is saying is that these impressions, right, of consciousness, Lucifer and heart, Christ, they're, they're weakening. And that's opening up the door for this robotic, cyborg -y, um, man-machine type of energy of Araman's world. So he says, In the light of the imminent incarnation of Araman, because above he explains how Lucifer incarnated in a human body during the third millennium before Christ, Araman will incarnate in the third millennium after Christ. And then another thing is that Lucifer incarnated in the East, Christ incarnated in the Middle East, and so Araman is going to incarnate in the West, possibly the Midwest. And so he says, in light of the imminent incarnation of Ariman, Steiner offers caveats and suggestions on how to avoid strengthening the Ariamonic impulse. Because remember, this this is about the mind and what what's going on in our minds as well. It's as above, so below. So in the mind, but also in the physical. It's everywhere. <laughs> so he says that. Um, I shall merely put before you the deeper fact, namely that no true understanding of Christ can be reached by the simple, easygoing perusal of the Gospels beloved by most religious denominations and sects today. The point to remember is, however, that the people who do most to prepare for the incarnation of Ariman are those who constantly preach. All that is required is to read the Gospels word for word, no more than that. In other words, Steiner is saying that the fundamentalists are fundamentally wrong. But I feel like what he's saying is he's speaking about dogma as well, right? So anything dogmatic belongs in the terrain or in the turf or in the mindscape of Araman. So if you're going at whatever you're doing and you're going about it in a dogmatic way, you're helping strengthen that energy, which helps to bring that energy into being. And further down, a quote is, 
that can we escape Aramon and Lucifer by avoiding them? You may have thought so as I did at first, writes this author. But Steiner's answer is a firm no. Instead, he argues for you and me to maintain a balance between the influence of Lucifer and of Aramon. And how can we train ourselves to do this? By permeating what takes Aramonic form within us with a strongly Luciferic element. Right. So it's, um, we'll, we'll see what he means as we move further through this. I'll play you four videos <laughs> and um, it's, it's, they're going to be relatively back to back. So um, I'll, I'll pick you up in between each one of them. So the first one that we're going to watch is a short blip of an interview back from 2013 with the then D-Wave chief scientist and co-founder Eric Ladizinski. And um, just listen to what he has to say. You know, sort of this Alice in Wonderland stuff. I mean, uh, one interpretation for quantum mechanics is that there's parallel universes, mm -hmm. right? And that uh, uh, when you look at the quantum mechanical equations and they tell you that all these disparate physical phenomena are happening at the same time, you know, like the same physical object being in many places at once, or living out many possibilities simultaneously, that kind of thing. The idea is, that, you know, the basic idea behind quantum computing is if I could have a, if I could have single objects live out many possibilities simultaneously, what if I could have computing elements, the same physical hardware, uh, behave as if it was many, many pieces of hardware, or many, one processor operating like it's uh, an incredible number of processors operating in parallel, doing different parts of a very difficult problem. Uh, but the thing is, the way parallel processes are done today, you actually have to build physically new processors, right? But what if one processor could behave like 10 to the 500th processors operating in parallel? You know, it staggers the mind, right? So he was giving this talk, and David Deutsch, who was sort of the progenitor of quantum computing, he's, he's a big fan of the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics. Um, he came up with this idea by saying, you know, what if, what if you could access all these parallel realities and do different parts of a complex computation in them simultaneously and, and somehow extract information from the multiverse, right? Um, this was an amazing thing. You're harnessing a whole new resource in nature. You're technologically accessing these parallel universes, and this is something that human beings have not been able to do, you know, here before. Uh, so I went to this lecture, was kind of had kind of had my mind blown, and at that moment decided that's what I'm going to do. And beyond that, I said I'm already working with materials, superconductors, and building superconducting circuits um, and objects that behave quantum mechanically at a macroscopic scale. So when I walked out of that lecture, I thought. He's talking about doing quantum computing. He talked about you know doing it with ions, uh, you know nuclear magnetic resonance, photons, and when I walked out, I thought, well, yeah, those are all microscopic systems, and it's very difficult to access and control and manipulate and engineer microscopic systems, but superconducting circuits are macroscopic. If you could get, and they already demonstrate a lot of the requisite behavior, if you could. Uh, build quantum computing elements out of superconducting circuits, you could have a macroscopic technology where it's already known how to build large-scale versions of that. Um, so I got very excited about that idea, so I, I, I proposed it to Arnold. And at the time he said, uh, uh, you seem to really be into this, I like the, your idea, uh, I'll pay you one day a week to think about it. So one day out of a week, just and give me a lecture every couple of weeks about what you're thinking. So that's how that started. And uh, in the course of that, over the next two years, um, I read every paper I could find on the internet, spending late nights at the UCLA library. And it was interesting because uh, what I discovered was this uh, amazing story that was going on. This idea, why is it if the microscopic world behaves in this Alice in Wonderland-like way and we're made out of those atomic constituents, why don't we behave that way? 
right? This was a big quandary. Why does quantum mechanics not work when you get to a certain scale? And yet, we saw signatures of quantum mechanics in things like superconductors at large scales. So this is very intriguing. So when I started uh, looking into this field, I found a paper at UCLA by uh, a Nobel Prize winning physicist, Tony Leggett. And what he predicted in this paper was, if you wanted to see a Schrodinger's cat, now not actually a cat, but if you wanted to see a macroscopic object, um, uh, very, very large compared to the scale of atoms, that would be, you could put into two states simultaneously, he predicted it would be a squid. And that was, and I was working for the guy who invented it, and I was in a group where we built them routinely. I went to the UCLA library, I read that paper, and I went, wow. Right, so the next video that I'm showing you guys is of Jordy Rose, and here he does a talk in 2015. Jordy Rose and Eric Ladizinski worked together. They founded D-Wave Systems together, and D-Wave Systems was the first company to build quantum computers. And these computers are super expensive, like they cost between 15 and 20 million each. And so not many organizations have one yet, but they're everywhere. All right. So um, at the same time, NASA has them. Google has them, is using them to develop AI. University of Southern California, he mentions that, has one. Um, VW has them. They also work with um, bus, bus manufacturers to create these smart buses, right, that drive on GPS navigation and just, you know, figure things out themselves and the bus driver is only there just in case something goes wrong. So this is all part of, you know, what this company is doing. Now, Jordy, as far as I know, has stepped away as far as I've understood from the company and he's now focusing on a second, another company that he has, which is focusing on developing artificial intelligence. But let's just listen in really quickly to what he has to say here in this talk. For a variety of reasons that maybe you'll understand when I go through this. And I assured him that Bear Bear was as real as anything else in the world. And he said, but he can't speak and he can't move. And so I said, well, what you really mean is he's not alive. And he said, yes, that's what I mean. So for very young children, the sense of being real and the sense of being alive are somehow connected. And I'm going to circle back to this point at the end. But before I do that, I'm going to tell you a little bit about quantum computers and why people care so much about them. There are literally tens of thousands of some of the brightest people in the world today trying to build these machines and understand them. And I'm going to tell you why. In my last 15 years of working on this type of stuff, I found that scientists divide up into two categories of zealots about this field. The first half are people who are absolutely entranced by the physics of these things. This quote is from a respectable scientist, in fact, one of the founders of this field, that may be a little bit, may look a little strange to you who don't follow theoretical physics, but there is a very clear prediction that our most successful theory of nature makes, and that is that there are an enormous number, mind-bogglingly large number, of parallel realities, as real as this one, that have different consistent histories. So imagine a world where all of the laws of physics as we know them are obeyed, but different decisions were made along the way. Different decisions at the level of tiny microscopic particles, different decisions all the way up to what you just chose to eat for lunch, and whether you chose to come to this session or not. Quantum mechanics makes a very specific prediction that all of those are as real as the thing that you remember. And this is bizarre, because we don't see those other things. But science has reached the point now where we can build machines that exploit those other worlds. And quantum computers are perhaps the most exciting of all of these that we have within, or almost within our grasp right now. So people from a physics background love this. They want to understand the world. They want to understand the, the universe, how it all works. There's another type of person who tends to come from the computer science side that's like, yeah, okay, that's all great. But there's a different thing going on here, which is just as exciting, if not more, and that these machines that supposedly can do this wild stuff, let's forget about how they work, 
if you could build one, could solve problems that you could never, ever solve with any computer of the sort that we built. If you took every single atom of silicon in the world and made the most sophisticated conventional Intel style processor that you could build, there are problems we know of that I could write down on a sheet of paper that you could never, ever, ever solve with that thing. That you could with this kind of machine. So that's very exciting. Humans use tools to do things. If you give humans a new kind of tool that can do things that you couldn't otherwise do, imagine the possibilities. So you may think, well, this is all fine and dandy, but is, aren't these things in the realm of theory and speculation kind of in the same regime as um, other futuristic things you may have heard of which may be allowed by the laws of physics but aren't here yet? That's not true. There are, in fact, many of these machines deployed now in openly available research centers following the model that was used to introduce supercomputers to the world. They're too big and ornery and difficult to operate to put in your home, too expensive also, but you can give them to a place which will manage them as a shared resource that will offer that service to the world. And there are two of these now. One of them is at the University of Southern California. And this analogy with flight, I think, is an interesting one. So a horse can beat, or could, beat the uh, initial flight of the, the Wright brothers' flight in speed. But a plane is not a faster horse. A plane is a different kind of machine. The plane takes advantage of another, thing, another resource that nature gives us, this third dimension, in order to do something that matters to people better than you could do with any horse. It doesn't matter how fast you make a horse, it will never fly at least the kinds of horses that we know about. So these types of computers now are being thought of in the same way. They're not terrifically powerful yet, but they're doing something completely different than what your computer does. And that thing is like flight. It gives these computers access to these new resources, maybe you could call them parallel universes, in order to do something that you couldn't otherwise do. Okay, so my previous company was D-Wave. I'll just uh, show you a couple things. We built what are still the world's only quantum computers that you can buy. And the company, D-Wave, has been doing this. Thanks. I didn't really have much to do with it, but you know. Like, so this is one of them. Um, this is one of the processors. And uh, a lot of interesting things happened to me over the years there. I got sent pajamas. Uh, a whole bunch of stuff, you know, there's lots of interesting things that happen when you build something like a quantum computer. But just as an aside, because I thought it was funny, one of the interesting things that's happened from the D-Wave story is there's this gigantic uh, conspiracy that's arisen on the internet that goes like this. So D-Wave builds quantum computers. The way that they work, if you know this, how this works, is one of the interpretations is that you tap into these parallel universes and they do computations. Sounds really weird. But uh, what, what, what's happened is this idea has been hijacked to describe something called the Mandela effect, which is this thing where um, the past changes. So think about something you know to be true from the past. And then imagine you went out on the internet and you can't find it at all. It's not there. It doesn't match with your experience. So these people think that D-Wave is responsible and CERN. And of course, the quantum key to the abyss factors into it somehow. I'm not exactly sure how. OK, so that, that's just D-Wave. Uh, I did that for about 15 years. It was a lot of fun. A big science project that we turned into a commercial entity. Uh, that was a warm up for Kindred. So Kindred is much, much, much more ambitious than D-Wave. And what Kindred is trying to do is build real AI. So what you've heard about AI is not what we mean by AI. What we mean by AI is a software system that can do literally anything that a human can do. Literally anything. And obviously, computers are better at things than people in lots of different ways. So now imagine, not only can they do everything that a human can do, but they can do everything that the best human at any task could do better than them. So imagine there was the mental Olympics of the 100 meter dash and Usain Bolt is the fastest person. Now imagine that's some kind of a mental thing like writing a novel or writing whatever. 
Imagine now that the thing is so much faster than Usain Bolt, like for example, it's a spaceship, yeah? It's, it's still doing the same thing, but it's doing it so much better because we're limited, because we're people. So um, what Kindred is trying to do is solve this problem. How do you build machines that are better than people at everything? Now there's a mental block that we have here when we think about this. Because when you think about that, one of your questions might be, for example, what are the applications of this? So imagine this. Imagine, for $10, let's say, I could build a, uh, a machine, like a little robot that had fingers and eyes and all that, and it could do your job better than you, no matter what it is, and I could sell that to your employer for, say, $15 and make a profit, instead of having to pay you $100,000 a year. Now imagine that was true for every single job. So that's what we're talking about here, is a complete and utter transformative change that of the likes of which has never been seen before in the history of humanity, making the industrial revolution look like a little tiny blip on the path that humans have taken from when we emerged from the ooze a few billion years ago. We are right on the verge of that transition now. So uh, this guy, Rich Sutton, is one of the most famous people in the academic world of AI. And like many, when asked, when will this happen, he says things like this. 25% chance within 13 years of this thing that I'm talking about. You know, when you think about what, is on the, what you read on the news, you know, CNN, BuzzFeed, whatever, they're all kind of the same nowadays. Think about how unimportant that thing is that you're reading if this is true. Yeah? So what does this have to do with aliens? So uh, Sam Harris, who I quite admire, is a very interesting guy, um, was reciting this parable at a TED talk that he was giving. And it goes something like this. So I am, uh, say I'm the president of the United States. So I received this message from the heavens. So my microwave dish, my SETI dish, finally captures something. And what it says is, in 50 years, or 13 years, we're coming to your planet. You've got to be ready. Now just imagine what would happen if, it, if that happened. A super intelligent alien race beamed down a message to all of us Earthlings saying, we're coming July 13th. 2030, and boy, you better be ready because the mothership is landing right on the front lawn of the White House or wherever you wanted to land on that day. The amount of resources that would be marshaled to try to figure out what to do would, it would encompass the whole world. AI is just like that. So when this thing that I'm talking about happens, it's going to be exactly the thing that you're thinking about, about those super intelligent AIs. So the one thing I can tell you is they're not going to be like us. So alien means, you know, different. These things that we're building are not going to be people. They might be really smart. They might be really good at all sorts of different things. But they're not going to be like us. They're going to be aliens. And they're going to be, I'm sorry to say, way smarter than every single person in this room in ways that we can't even comprehend. So this, of course, triggers a lot of alarm. One of the guys who talks about this is Elon, who uh, says things like this. Like, when you do this, beware. Because you think, just like the guy in the stories, that when you do this, you're going to put that, that, that little guy in a pentagram, and you're going to have your holy water out. And you're going to wave it at the thing, and by God, it's going to do exactly what you say, and not one thing more. But it never works out that way. So uh, this, is an, this is an attitude that some are having, this emerging alarmism about the way this is going to go. But this, these words, demons, doesn't capture the essence of what's happening here. Uh, I don't know if any of you are uh, turn-of-the-century weird fiction fans, but there's this guy named H.P. Lovecraft, who's a very famous American weird fiction author. And he exposed a, a view which is called cosmicism. And the essence of cosmicism is cosmic indifference. So he, what he was saying is basically, yes, there are these massively intelligent entities out there, 
but they're not good, they're not evil. They just don't give a shit about you even in the slightest. The same way that you don't care about an ant is the same way they're not going to care about you. And these things that we're summoning into the world now are not demons, they're not evil, but they're more like the Lovecraftian great old ones. There are entities that are not necessarily going to be aligned with what we want. So this transition is really, really massively important for our entire species to navigate. And going back to that thing that Sam Harris was saying, nobody is paying attention. This thing is happening in the background while people bicker about politics and what, what's going to be in the health care plan in the US. And underneath it all is this rising tsunami that, if we're not careful, is going to wipe us all out. So um, on that uh, pleasant note, uh, we're hiring people <laughs> <laughs> to try to make something like this happen. Uh, and uh, of course, you know, this is a very uh, difficult project, of course, and I'm, I'm kind of a little bit tongue in cheek about all this, like, you know, uh, how, how bad things are, because uh, it's not really like that. You know, there's technology is a double edged sword, even something like this. Uh, it's agnostic, it depends who wields it. If you want to have a say in how all this goes down, you can't sit on the sidelines. And one of the ways that you can get involved and really change the world, like, you know, a lot of people say, hey, join the Marines, you'll change the world or whatever. This is this thing, this opportunity that I'm talking about here in Vancouver is an opportunity for you to literally change the world. Because the code that you write may be running in the brains of these things in 10 years. So this is a, this is a huge opportunity. I, uh, I, I'm going to ask that anybody here who is a software engineer who's really good uh, to talk to any one of these three folks who are sat at the back there, who are uh, Suzanne founded Kindred, um, and Olivia and Paula are uh, some of our key folks in Vancouver, or talk to me, and um, uh, we'll have a conversation. Um, by the way, I love Joseph's talk. It's true. Uh, startup life can be very, very difficult. And uh, you will fail many, many, many times before you succeed, uh, just as a matter of course. Thanks. OK, and this last video, and then I'll pick you guys up again, <laughs> is another version or another aspect of Jordy. So um, just watch, just to close it off, because um, I don't want to ever, you know, misrepresent anybody, right? So as we draw to a close, um, at all of these events that I've been at, I've realized that there are fans and followers and readers of you guys in the audience and they're here for you actually they came specifically to hear you and so i'd like to end by asking each of you to pretend you're speaking to just one of them individually and give them your best wishes for their human flourishing <laughs> if you have young children restrict their screen use as much as you can uh until as late as they can be that's a piece of advice number one Piece of advice number two, your happiness derives from your relationship with the people that you look in the eye, not your Twitter friends or your Facebook friends. As a subcategory of piece of advice number two, stop using social media. Okay. Go back, if you can, and I know not everybody can, go back to thinking locally so when you buy food, when you think about where your water comes from, when you think about where your electricity comes from, when you think about where your friends are, think about the real people who are around you and, uh, and not the weird thing that happens on the internet. And my last piece of advice um, is forgive the people around you for not being perfect. Because those 14 or 15 people that you really know well will do things that really annoy you a lot all the time because they're like you, they're not perfect, but they're all that you've got 
and when you when you show them forgiveness and affection you deepen the bonds that you have with them and they'll show that back to you and at the end of the day all that you've got are these personal connections with the people around you so that's my advice to the uh <laughs> to any fans that i might have here. <clears throat>
and created a vast network, um, which is like a neural network, like a, a nervous system, right? Um, which is our World Wide Web, which is where information flows. That's what e happens in your nervous system is information flows along it, right? Ties everything together. So is this like this planet becoming one huge body that is about to be possessed? Let's see what Steiner says to that. So Steiner talks in this book, right? He talks about we're going to be doing a little bit of back and forth jumping but in this book he talks about the eighth sphere this one is called the occult movement in the 19th century and he says there are not many words that can be used for characterizing the eighth sphere and the fact that all mention was avoided for so long will also enable you to realize what is involved when one speaks of it and there's a backstory to this that I won't get into because it'll lead me off track, but <laughs> let's just say that Steiner believed and taught that we move through an evolutionary process going through seven planets. And these planets are Saturn, Sun and Moon, Earth, although they're not really planets, Jupiter, Venus, and Vulcan. Right now, as you can see, we're in this Earth cycle. But simultaneously, um, where we're in all other levels too, but right now our consciousness is is here right so jupiter the new jupiter is what we're going to be what we're evolving into or what we're moving into and as you can tell earth is the only one that has this eighth sphere and it says here you know that human evolution takes its course through the seven spheres of saturn sun moon earth jupiter venus vulcan we will conceive that besides these seven spheres, there's still something else which lies outside them and yet is in some way related to the earth. Here then we have a sphere visible only to visionary imaginative clairvoyance, which stands there as an eighth sphere over and above the seven which constitute the domain of the ordered and regular evolution of mankind. All such sketches are of course purely diagrammic, diagrammatic, one is obliged to draw separately spheres which can only be observed each within the other for you will certainly have realized that from our studies that as long as man is within the material world he makes his observations through the senses and thinks with the intellect he is standing in the fourth sphere the earth sphere if he develops his faculties of soul sufficiently to be able to see the third sphere the moon sphere then he takes a far flight but not in the spatial sense. He observes not from another place, but physically speaking, spatially speaking from the same place. These seven spheres ought therefore in reality to be drawn within one another. They are successive stages and states of evolution and fundamentally such a diagram is of no other value than is if one were to say human beings develop from birth to the seventh year in a first stage, from the seventh to the 14th year in a second stage and so on, okay? So what he's saying, and I'm going to pull it together in a nutshell for you, is that this eighth sphere is an imaginary sphere, right? And the imagination, whatever's in the imagination is real. So it is very real, but then again, it's not. It's like virtual reality. And the earth is within that. And this virtual reality was created by Lucifer and Ahriman. And what they do is they pull off material substance off the earth to create or generate this, this sphere. So the powers that be that are benevolent and on our side saw what was going on. So this would be Yahweh and Sophia. And they created the moon. And the moon is much denser and heavier than the earth. And it it's much harder to draw off ener uh, material from the moon than it is from the earth. And so all this, um, that means that Lucifer and Araman, because the moon is stabilizing the earth, they can't draw off as much as much power as they, they could in the beginning. So what they're trying to do now is to draw it off the human mind. They're drawing it off the head of human beings. And, um, he says that here uh, the strength of the prowess let's see 
Um, sorry guys. Lucifer and Armand strive unceasingly to draw from the Earth's substances whatever they can snatch in order to form their H8 sphere, which then, when it is sufficiently advanced, will be detached from the Earth and go its own way in the cosmos together with Lucifer and Armand. Needless to say, the Earth would then pass over to Jupiter as a mere torso. But man, as you realize, has his established place in the whole of Earth evolution, for he's mineralized through and through. We are permeated by the mineralizing process, which is itself drawn into this battle so that morsels of this substance can be continually wrested from it. Therefore, we ourselves are involved in the battle, and Lucifer and Ahriman battle against the spirits of form with the aim of wresting mineral substance from us everywhere. The most perfect of all is our organ of thinking, the brain and the skull, and there the battle of which I have spoken is the most vehement, precisely because this human head, this human brain, is fashioned as it is, and it is so fashioned because at this place in our body, Lucifer and Aramantu have been the most successful in wresting mineral substance from us. Physical substance there is more spiritualized than anywhere else. The formation of our skull is due to the fact that it is there that most have been wrested from us, and so on and so on and so forth. So it's a lot of text, but in a nutshell, I just gave you what's 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 going on, right? So this is not something this fear you can't see with your eyes, right? So these are mental dimensions and these are accessed through states of being or belief sets, focus, um, you know, experiential. It's not something that you think about and then you just, okay, you know, I'm in it. it it's, it's, you have to really align with it. And unfortunately, a lot of us do. So let's move on because you guys, I'll be posting the links in the description box below as always, or in the comment section. And, um, we'll we'll uh move on here so in this part he talks about deception as well that people that are psychically open or gifted in any which way or you know they see things that they really have to test the spirits they really have to be discern and become aware because most of the time much of the time it is deception what is happening and deceiving spirits or deceiving energies and that they tap into this virtual reality of the eighth sphere which isn't real but due to our nature, human, human, humankind's nature, we can make it real, right? Because whatever, where we concentrate, see, these entities and the energies, the archons, they are jealous of us because we have this ability to focus our intent and to concentrate, right? Because what that does is we were created in the image of the creator, right? So we can create things, we can make things happen. And so when we focus on something we believe it to be real and we put energy in there we can pass on that life force energy and awaken it to life right and so that's what they want us to do and that's what we have been doing unwittingly unwillingly right because we've been deceived we've been creating a world that is in alignment with them that works for them that feeds them but we haven't been creating a world that works for us that feeds us and supports us because we don't even have a true view because of this deception program that is running we don't have a true view of ourselves of the world our place in it or or life at all you know this universe it's like we're looking out and we're seeing this it's like the truman show right we're seeing something artificial that isn't there it's like once this veil is torn down all this life just opens up for us and there's life all through the universe and everywhere but we're being kept in this place through deception so and that's basically what he's saying. And we're the ones that are also creating this because we're being deceived into creating something that is for the benefit of something else. And they want to keep us locked in this forever. This is what they want. And But it's not going to happen. But if we don't wake up, then huh, it might take a little longer than planned. And this would go according to their plan, which would be to lead us off our path of evolution. Right. So... Here he says that this is what Araman looks like to him, to Steiner. And it's it's a familiar face, right? We we've, we've seen so many people speak about this, talk about this, these entities, these archons or these Ar armonic beings, they they look like this, right? So the classic very thin face, the big head, the slanted eyes, the um 
thin mouth, small mouth, right? We know this. But other people, right, have seen these and they say that they have reptilian, right? When they come into our world, they take reptilian forms. Now, not all reptilians are evil, but some of them are just like humans, right? Not all of us are. So, and um, they also take the form of a feet. Like, they look like very a tiny baby fetuses so that's the big head really skinny tiny body um but they also take another form and this one you got to check out some of them take the form of amoebas so let's have a look again just a refresher i mean we know what amoebas look like but let's look at them and see if it reminds you of the images that people have been taking lately right so the amoeba ones are the ones that let themselves be photographed and we think they're so wonderful <laughs> right we think they're so so amazing you know because we we um we photograph them right so orb photos so see and these that we think right they are uh you know spirit guides angels you name it they're not really they're not and we need to start becoming more discerning and and much much more questioning and much much more this is part of our spiritual spiritual maturation as well right so just keep that in mind there right um he talks about steiner talks about an occult war so he did believe that we're in a war between good and evil for the most you know that basic concept but the only way to win this war in a sense in what he's saying is to reconcile with the shadow is to reconcile with the dark right to balance that out to recognize it and to balance it out with the christ force energy he had a statue that depicted Christ in between Lucifer and Araman and Christ, that Christ in consciousness, that Christ energy was what kept it all at bay. And he explains that. And we'll dive into it a little bit more. So here we have Steiner and the Aramonic Deception. He wrote this book and we'll, you know, look into it. But he says that there was, of course, the Luciferic impulse, which manifested on earth in 3000 before Christ. The Luciferic impulse prepared the way for the Christ impulse. Both impulses began to fade and mankind has therefore become increasingly materialistic. He stated that this armonic deception emanates from an actual being. Now remember emanation. We talk about that in my spiritual development classes. There are four ways to, to, in this dimension that we're in, to create something, to make something come about. So we start with making something, then we move on to creating something, then we move on to uh, manifesting something, and the final part is emanation. And emanation seems to have the least effort, right? Because just by virtue of being somewhere, these are the gurus where they walk, the flowers spring up under their feet. You know, they emanate this energy. It's like a light bulb and it just emanates light. It emanates that which it is. So this energy that the aramonic deception is emanating is, is incredibly chaotic, toxic, and automatic and robotic and um tedious and heavy so it emmet proceeds from a super sensible being different from the being of christ or of lucifer if we look at the confused conditions of recent years we shall find that men have been brought to such chaotic conditions mainly through the aramonic powers so he says that while the Luciferic impulse pushed humanity into what Nietzsche might have called the Dionysian passion that gives birth to arts and brings humanity outside of itself, albeit according to Steiner with a false spirituality, Aramon is the power that makes man dry, prosaic, philistine, that ossifies him and brings him to the superstition of materialism. Aramon would seem to equate with the Christian perception of the Antichrist, right? And the true nature of being 
the true nature and being of man is essentially the effort to hold the balance between the powers of Lucifer and Aramon. The Christ impulse helps present humanity to establish this equilibrium. The Aramonic influence has been at work since the middle of the 15th century and will increase in strength until an actual incarnation of Aramon takes place among Western humanity. Boom. Those of you that have been watching my channel for some time know that I keep talking about this. I keep talking about this technological God, this technological entity that wants to incarnate, that wants to come into this world, that I've seen what is to happen. I've I've seen these energies they were shown to me and when I was taking plant medicines and I've seen this I've experienced this and I talked about it and here we have Rudolf Steiner talking about it. to be honest with you guys I've read his works but I haven't I knew about the Lucifer Armon part but I didn't dive into it into detail because I was focusing on other works of his on how to spiritually develop yourself and so on and so forth so this is as well new to me and I stumbled over it because I was diving into because I remembered his vaccine quote and I was diving into everything around that and this is why it came up for me and I felt I needed to do this video because it just blows my mind how accurate he is and how much he's 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 talked about this so he talks about the the preparation now it is characteristic he says of such things that they are prepared long in advance harmonic powers prepare the evolution of mankind in such a way that it can fall pray to Armon when he appears in human form within Western civilization. Armon will appear in human form and the only question is how will he find humanity prepared? Will his preparations have secured for him the followers of the whole of mankind that today calls itself civilized or will he find a humanity that can offer resistance? Right? And so we have not much time left to prepare. Okay, I'm going to say that we have not much time left to prepare. Now, in all honesty, my guides have been telling me 2020 to 2023 is going to be a time, a window of opportunity. It's going to be a time where we can see the beauty of the world that we could inhabit. And 2023 is the year that things start going uphill for us again, where we start moving out of this downward cycle that we've been in for quite a long time. And it's because we're seeing what we can make. We're seeing what we could have. We're seeing what we could do. And at first I didn't understand. I realize now I didn't understand because I had a, a perfect image of how this was going to work. And when everything started unfolding this year, I thought, oh my gosh, but I'm seeing how we are seeing a good world. We are seeing what a perfect world could look like because we're losing the world that we have right we're losing it and so as we're losing it where we're realizing what we had we're realizing who we are we're realizing what we can do and this is the mass awakening so my guides were right but i was approaching it from the wrong point of view from the wrong side of the 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 equation right so it says here that when araman comes through he's coming through as he's going to be bringing this consciousness with him remember that this is a force this emanates energy this emanates consciousness just like god does or jesus or so on and so forth and it's the energy that it emanates is mechanical and mathematical so what happens is people lose their touch to life they're to lose their touch to the magic of life and everything becomes routine mundane calculable um there's no purpose to anything right it robs the spirit it robs the soul and he says it's like looking out at the stars and the planets and the comets and not feeling any awe anymore not feeling anything anymore and all you see is the mathematics of it all right and the science of mechanics so that's what he's bringing he's motivating rationalism materialism and the political systems that go in hand in hand with that are very authoritarian totalitarian they're fascist right so he's bringing in scientific superstition. He's bringing in all of the scientism, right? And it's, it's, um, it says here, the second method of the harmonic deception is to split society into contending factions. Since the times of the Reformation and the Renaissance, the economist has emerged as the new priest 
into the increasingly materialistic world, while Steiner also pointed out that Christian religion had also become desacralized. Since that time, the economist has been in command, he says. Rulers are in fact merely the handymen, the understrappers of the economist. Men must not imagine that the rulers of modern times are anything but the understrappers of the economist. He was writing this in 1918, 1919, these years. This is over a hundred years ago now, okay? He next alludes to a very important matter, the power that the bankers have assumed. He says, in the 19th century, the economical man is replaced for the first time by the man thinking in terms of banking. And in the 19th century, there is created for the first time the organization of finance, which swamps every other relationship. One must only be able to look into these things and follow them up empirically and practically. He says, the statement provides the key to the history of the modern world for the past several hundred years. If men do not realize that the right states and the organism of the spirit must be set against the economic order called up through the economists and the banks, then again through this lack of awareness, Ahriman will find an important instrument for preparing his incarnation. So what that means is that what we talked about in other videos that I've done is that our consciousness and our awareness of spirit and spiritual laws and spiritual realities has to be on a level. Our, our maturation has to be as high as our technological understanding and achievements. Otherwise, we're in trouble and we're going to be turning into this harmonic technological society. He also talks about the role of secret societies. And to put this in a nutshell, he's saying that they're run on power, that because by way of their nature, right? By way of their nature and their, their, their way of being held to secrecy, it was the, the cream of the crop, right? So the upper echelon, the rulers and the leaders of the world that would find themselves in these secret societies. And so inevitably it became about power. It became about power. And so how these secret societies run things by power behind the scenes. And that some of them have been founded as the external instruments for certain occult political impulses. He's writing this in 1919, right? 1919. Steiner warned, if one wants a person of modern times to see clearly in order to meet the world openly and understand it, then one should not let oneself be blinded by democratic logic, which is justified only in its sphere, or by phrases concerning democratic progress, etc. One would have to also point to the interposing of something that reveals itself in the attempt to give rulership to the few through the means available within the lodges, namely ritual and its suggestive effect. Oh my gosh, right? Rituals and suggestive effects. We know this is how they work. So he, he talks about that a little bit more, right? And, um, but we're going to move on. And we're going to have a look at this article here. Because it is so convoluted, you guys. So convoluted. But we know that David Rockefeller was a globalist, and we know that he had certain ideas about things that he tried to implement and get into being, right? Not only him, but this whole little clique there. And we know that because he said it so many times, he admired China, right? He admired how China had pulled things out of the ground, what China had done, and he thought that China needed to um, be the order of the day, that we needed to follow that kind of thing, um, the way China had done it. So I hope that loads. In history. And he said that in the 70s. Right? He said that in the 70s after a trip to China, and he did multiple trips to China. He built schools and hospitals. He invested in Chinese businesses and so on. Um, he said after a trip to China, David Rockefeller plays, praised Mao Zedong, who had slaughtered over 40 million people. His report from a China traveler highlights the goals represented in UN reports, such as the Commission on Global Governance, we've heard a lot about that lately, and UNESCO's Our Creative Diversity, both focus on lofty ideals such as peace 
peace, harmony, and unity in the Cometarian global village, a vision that demands absolute control and universal participation in facilitated small groups modeled by the hierarchy of Soviets or councils in communist lands. So he says, this is the quote, one is impressed immediately by the sense of national harmony. Whatever the price, whatever the price, is he kidding me? of the Chinese revolution, it has obviously succeeded in fostering high morale and community purpose. General and social and economic progress is no less impressive. The enormous social advances of China have benefited greatly from the singleness of ideology and purpose. The social experiment in China under Chairman Mao's leadership is one of the most important and successful in history. This was published in the New York Times in 1973. So. It's, 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 you know, having a look at the various, um, now what is China? It's communist. And what is it based on Marxism, right? Um, in modern China, we wouldn't probably call a communist country anymore. It may be a socialist capital capitalistic, but it's, it's not fully communist anymore, but it definitely was. <laughs> And so if they're saying this is this is great, you know, for our new world order, this is the structure that we want to have. And we're hearing Rudolf Steiner, you know, saying that fascism, Marxism, these are all hallmarks of Ahriman and an Ahrimanic consciousness. It just makes you go, hmm, it really makes you start to think. So I'll just leave that with you. So we'll go through a couple notes, right? So I'm not going to go through everything, obviously, because... Rudolf Steiner was prolific and like I said every sentence can lead you down a different little rabbit hole but here in this letter on Christ in relation to Lucifer and Araman he writes he writes about the relationship between Christ Lucifer and Araman and so to put it in a nutshell it says that through the, the unconditional love and the compassion of Christ that Armand and Lucifer can't bear it. They cannot bear being touched by this, this infinite compassion, this infinite love. And so what it makes Lucifer do is it makes Lucifer fall from his height. And what it makes Armand do is withdraw and retreat. So um, it says here, this Christ figure is placed, he's talking about the sculpture that he had placed in his Gertianum. And the Christ figure is placed in such a way that it seems to be standing in front of a rock that towers noticeably at his left side with its peak extending over his head. On top of the rock there will be another figure winged but with his wings broken who for this reason begins to fall into the abyss. It must not appear, however, as if the Christ himself were breaking the wings of this being. Rather, the interaction of the two figures must be portrayed artistically to show how the Christ, by the very motion of raising his hand, is expressing his infinite compassion for this being. Yet this being cannot bear the energy flowing upward through arm and hand, an energy that is evidenced by indentations that the fingers of the extended hand seem to leave in the rock itself. When this being comes into proximity with the Christ being, he feels something that may be expressed in the words, I cannot bear the radiation of such purity upon me. This feeling dominates so essentially as to break his upper being's wings and cause his imminent plunge into the abyss. So it was really important and what had to be conveyed in the statue is that the being must be portrayed as having caused his own fall for what is to be shown plunging downward with broken wings is Lucifer. Now, on the other side of the group, towards the right of the Christ figure, the rock will have a ledge and a concave underneath. In this depression, there will be another winged figure who, with his arm-like organs, turns toward the ledge above. The Christ figure in the middle has his right hand directed downward and the left one upward. Um, Araman cannot bear this compassion either that comes from the Christ energy and he writhes with pain from what the hand of the Christ exudes. This radiance from Christ's hand causes the golden veins down in the rock depression to wind around Araman's body like strong cords and shackle him. What is happening to Lucifer is his own doing. The same is true with Araman. So oh, the Christ in you or this Christ energy irradiates such 
unconditional love and unconditional compassion that it eases the energies of the aramonic energies or the luciferian energies as well and brings balance brings balance into the being so he says here um I find this to be a very important part of this, this Christ in relation to Lucifer and Ariman text. He writes, certainly it is generally admitted that there is a Lucifer and or an Ariman, but in so doing, it is made to appear that from these two, one must flee as if one wished to say, I want nothing to do with the Lucifer and Ariman. In yesterday's public lecture, I described the way in which the divine spiritual forces can be found. If these forces did not want to have anything to do with Lucifer and Ariman, the world could not exist. One does not gain the proper relationship to these two by saying, Lucifer, I flee from you, Ariman, I flee from you. Rather, everything that man has to strive for as a result of the Christ impulse must be seen as similar to the equilibrious state of a pendulum. In the center, the pendulum is in perfect balance, but it must oscillate to one side or the other. The same applies to man's development here on earth. Man, man must oscillate to the one side according to the Luciferic principle and to the other according to the principle of Ariman, but he must maintain his equilibrium through the cultivation of Paul's declaration, not I, but Christ in me. Yes. <laughs> So um, to understand the Christ and his quintessential activity, we must conceive of him as a reality, as a working force. Okay, so I'll leave you to investigate that a little bit more and we'll move into the next one, the Aramonic Deception. And he says here, if we inquire who stirs up nations against each other, who raises the questions that are directing humanity today? The answer is harmonic deception, which plays into human life. And in this field, men very easily let themselves be deceived. They are not willing to descend to the lower strata where reality is to be found. For you see, Armand skillfully prepares his gold beforehand. Ever since the Reformation and the Renaissance, the economist has been emerging in modern civilization as the representative governing type. That's an actual fact. If you go back to ancient times, even to those that I have characterized today as the Luciferic, who were the governing types then? initiates the in egyptian pharaohs the babylonian rulers the asiatic rulers they were initiates then the priest type emerged as ruler and the priest type was really um was really the ruler right up to the reformation and the renaissance since that the economist has been in command there we go rulers are in fact merely the handymen the understrappers of the economists one must not imagine that the rulers of modern times are anything but the understrappers of the economists all that has resulted by law of way of law and justice one should study it carefully it is simply a consequence of what economically oriented men have thought in the 19th century the economical man is replaced for the first time by the man thinking in terms of banking and in the 19th century there is created for the first time the organization of finance which swamps every other relationship one must only be able to look into these things and follow them up empirically and practically once again so you know it's it's He's, he's telling you right there, like the mid 1800s was when this, this all started, right? This layer, this level and, um, with this banking elite, right? So it goes back to pretty much then it goes back to with the spirit that led us to the banking elite that really came into being around the Renaissance, but the structures of the world that we live in today started you know even before that but when it comes to economy and finance started then okay so let's see he wrote so much and i want to go through with you with everything but i'm realizing this is really long and um In this first lecture, Lecture 1, The Incarnation of Lucifer in Asia in the Third Millennium, he writes, that just as there was an incarnation of lucifer in the flesh and the incarnation of christ in the flesh so before only a part of the third millennium of the post-christian era has elapsed there will be in the west an actual incarnation of arman arman in the flesh 
Humanity on Earth cannot escape this incarnation of Ariman. It will come inevitably. But what matters is that men shall find the right vantage point from which to confront it. He writes, Whenever preparation is being made for incarnations of this character, we must be alert to certain indicative trends in evolution. A being like Araman, who will incarnate in the West in time to come, prepares for this incarnation in advance with a view to his incarnation on the Earth. Araman guides certain forces in evolution in such a way that they may be of the greatest possible advantage to him. An evil would result were men to live on in a state of drowsy unawareness, unable to recognize certain phenomena in life as preparations for Armand's incarnation in the flesh. So he's written a lot of interesting things, but what I also find interesting is how he nails our, you know, our the feeling right now, right? So this drowsy unawareness, unable to recognize certain phenomena in life as preparations for Armand's incarnation. So here he says, what numbers of people there are today who no longer value the spirit for the sake of the spirit or the soul for the sake of the soul. They are out to absorb from cultural life only what is regarded as useful. This is a significant and mysterious factor in the life of modern humanity and one must, that must be lifted into the full light of consciousness. The average citizen who works assiduously in his office from morning till evening and then goes through the habitual evening routine will not allow himself to get mixed up with what he calls calls the twaddle to be found in anthroposophy. It seems to him entirely redundant for he thinks that is something one cannot eat. <laughs> so he battled back then the same things. He speaks about beliefs and common denominations and so on and so forth. So like I keep repeating, it's it's so much. But you're getting the gist. You're getting the gist that basically he's saying this is a cyborg entity that's going to lead us to a technological world where we tie into machines otherwise we you know we will not survive and this is a part of our evolutionary path however how are we going to encounter that do we really need to have those experiences is there anything that we can do and he says uh, yes right he says yes balance those energies within yourself mm -hmm. which means going into healing right and and confronting those truthfully dark so not these oh giggle giggle i did a dark shadow meditation today but really go into the muck of your mind you know and really go there go all the way there and clean it up and So we can go through each one, but the five lectures, and he also wrote a little bit of a treatise on the mystery of death and how we need to confront that. You know, we need to be prepared. We need to understand the spiritual worlds. We need to understand the spiritual realities, and this will help us with our fear of death, which then again lowers our manipulability, right? So I already, I also had these, um, these tabs open on different political sociological styles such as orthodox marxism which is the body of marxist thought that emerged after the death of karl marx and which became the official philosophy of the socialist movement as represented in the second international until the first world war in 1914. So it says that it includes the understanding that the material development advances in technology in the productive forces is the primary agent of change in the structure of society of human social relations and that social systems and their relations become contradictory and inefficient as the productive forces develop, which results in some form of social revolution arising in response to the mounting contradictions. So 
you know, here it, it's all these systems and these structures, right? If you look into archons, you'll see that archons work on three different levels, right? So one level is um, in our, in context, right? So in our cosmological understanding, it's infiltrated that. Then it's infiltrated our very minds, our understanding of ourselves, of life, our role in it. And it's also under infiltrated our sociological structures and shows itself, as stated before, through these um, predominantly authoritarian, top-down kind of governance, governing systems. So um, here I had a tab on socialist economies, how China and North Korea work, what is a socialist economy. So it's really good to research that as well. And, you know, researching this and, and looking at this, observing this, it teaches you how the, all these forces manifest and the forms that they take. And as you learn, you become less and less susceptible. You buy less into it. You know where your true power lies and your true identity is because all of these systems are not going to work. They're all illusion. They're all fantasy. They're all not going to work. The only system that's ultimately going to work long term is self-governance by aligning to God. And we have a long way to go for that. <laughs> so um, social democracy is something that's being thrown around. Basic income is something that's being thrown around. Um, we've got here. Kissinger, um, who actively uh, worked with the CCP to encourage growth, right? And it's it's uh, a lot of it is coming out, All right? Where is it here? Put directly, the school of thought advanced by Kissinger made this possible since the 1990s political and economic interest in the West actively worked with the Chinese Communist Party to support its growth. If the liberal order is to be saved, it will be by confronting and defeating China's challenge and so on and so forth. So it's, uh, again, an interesting article. The threat to world order is, is China. Hmm. George Soros who in an interview states that China must, announces China must lead the new world order. And he does that. There's a video, you can watch this video. And in that video, he says, I quote, I think this would be the time because you really need to bring China into the creation of a new world order, financial world order. They're kind of reluctant members of the IMF. They play along, but they don't make much of a contribution because it's not their institution. Their share is not commensurate. Their voting rights are not commensurate to their weight. So I think you need a new world order that China has to be part of the process of creating it and they have to buy in. They have to own it the same way as I said, the United States owns well, the Washington Consensus, the current order, and I think this would be a more stable one where you would have a coordinated policies. So they're all in on it, you know, they're every single one of them. They truly believe they're doing something positive for the world, right? Um, so this is another article that, that goes a little deeper into, you know, how, tri uh, how China works. So... In a nutshell, you guys, and I'll repeat it again once once I close this, but in a nutshell, everything we're going through was pre-predicted and it's leading down a certain path. And we have a choice, however, we have a choice to do the work that is necessary and then become invisible in the worst of it or to be awakened from the outside through external forces. Uh, forces. I hope you enjoyed that. I hope I'm getting you to um, research yourself, read up yourself, look into information for yourself, get to know things yourself, and I will talk to you soon. <laughs> By the way, if you guys would like to support this channel and support moi, please check the description box below where you're going to find a lot of information on various things that you can um, join me with. And not l last but not least, the spiritual development group that is coming up in a few weeks. If you're interested in joining me with that, just shoot me a mail. Thank you. You guys take care. Have a great evening and bye. But in a nutshell, what Rudolf Steiner is saying is that we don't stand a chance against these forces unless we confront them. 
and because we're unwilling to confront them in the spiritual and develop ourselves spiritually and learn about the spirit world and accept the spirit world as a reality and learn to deal with that and learn to live our lives um, physical and spiritual together because we're denying that spiritual part it's becoming stronger and stronger and stronger and it's overwhelming us and eventually it's going to manifest right so the darker shadow aspects that we're afraid of that we're stepping away from and because of this right there's this evolutionary cycle right because we're meant to deal with these forces we have to learn we can't stick our heads in the sand turn away pretend they don't exist and um, because that's what's delaying our evolution and because we're not encountering it on the inside we're having to encounter it on the outside and because of that you know um, Armand will manifest, will be born in about probably a couple hundred years from now, maybe, right? Or less, <laughs> since they're literally calling him in with, with AI and this, this rapid development of all these machines because he is preparing the path, he's preparing the earth for his incarnation, right? And um, if we would learn to deal with that, we wouldn't have to deal with what's coming now my spirit guides or before the messages that i've been receiving were all about 2020 to 2023 being a profound time in humanity a profound time where we have the choice um, which timeline we're going to be following what timeline we're going to be we're going to be seeing together and it seems that we're all together on this journey here right and um and this is the timeline that that we're all you know we're existing on multiple timelines simultaneously but where is your you right where are you and we're right here right now and so all you can do in this moment is do the best that you can in this moment to do your inner work to do that confrontation with Armand to within you, Lucifer within you, right? Integrate, assimilate, face your, this is more than facing your shadow. This is really going down into the, 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 the deep dungeons, going down into the dark, all these mystical stories of going down to Hades, going down to hell, going down and retrieving that peace, retrieving that life, retrieving that soul, retrieving that loved one and coming back up again. This is what we need to do. This is what is called for. And if humanity could, could do that, you know, and integrate spirituality into their or this understanding, the spiritual science, as Rudolf Steiner called it, into their day to day, um, we wouldn't be experiencing this. We wouldn't have to go through all of this. So this is an evolutionary process, which is meant to get us to a certain place. And it has to come from the outside because we refuse to encounter it on the inner. Right? So this is all our choice. It's all our choice and timeline. It's all preventable. But the way things are going right now, it looks like this is what's coming. Now, again, back to my guides, they did say 2020 to 2023 is the time of, of absolute where you see the potential of the world and what it could be. And 2023 is when we move into that. And now I'm realizing we're seeing it. We're seeing it, you know, by losing it. <laughs> and yes, there, there are opportunities opening up, but um, let's pray together and intend together and um, move forward together into that. And, and um, not, you know, and again, this is not about sticking your head in the sand and denying what's going on. Like these new ageisms, these were deceptions, they were disinformation, they were lies. You cannot avoid evil. You cannot avoid bad. You cannot avoid bad, but I'm just not going to look at it. You know, it's, it's still going to be there because it's a, it's a force in this universe. It's an energy that flows through our universe. How do we encounter it? How do we work with it? How do we um, balance it out in order to peacefully coexist with it, right? Um, how do we, and the only way is, is, is acknowledging, right? And loving and um, reconciling and continually doing so and continually having a look and not looking away and not running away and facing what is to face. That's what Don Juan Matus also said, that the sorcerers learned to face what was then and there in their reality, right? And this was a true form of mental discipline. It was a true form of grace, not having to run away, not having to disappear somewhere, not having to pretend it's something else, and to really be able to sit with that and be fully present, fully aware, and then make decisions from there. And this is what is called for, for us personally, but also collectively during this time, right?
right? And um, if we do not, it, it's it's going to be a rough awakening, okay? So, mwah, thank you for um, watching, and I'll see what else comes up and through. Take care. Bye.